I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back that know everything, they're just foolish because it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up, they don't see bass popping, they make it a couple casts, they leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts, and not catch one fish, and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off and dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. I'm your host, Rich Natoli, one of the Salt Strong coaches generally serving the Mid Atlantic and Northeast. And as always, I am joined by the lovely and talented Ed Gobo, owner of Captain Hank's Tackle. Ed, how you doing? Doing good, Rich. Doing good. Got out togging today, so we can talk a little on that. And it's a good day. It's a good day. Yeah, and I did not get out togging today. I have not been fishing for a few weeks. <laughs> so hoping to change that this week, get out on the water and get in on the fun. Um, everybody, we, we, we have a really good show tonight. I want to let everyone know that, um, you know, th this podcast and live stream on the Salt Strong channel is, uh, it is supported by the Insider Member Club. And that's now the organization that I work for. And that is the... Uh, organization that I think everybody should check out. So I would just suggest if you haven't checked it out, there's a link in the description of this. Go in and just check it out and see what it's all about. It is a group of, wow, over 35,000 anglers from all over the country, um, pretty much every state actually. So all the way up through the mid-Atlantic and northeast, all the way down the coast through the Gulf. That's where most of the folks are. And uh, man, you get tackle discounts, tons of information on the water fishing reports and a really cool tool, uh, for the smart fishing app, which really, if you want to hit the water and you don't want to do any planning, this has got you. It'll actually show you spots in your area based on a ton of different variables, including tide and trends and conditions, seasons, winds, uh, where to fish. So it's, it's a good, kind of like cheat code, especially when you're fishing a new area uh, to, to go out. So I would just suggest everyone go in there and check it out. Um, but we have a great episode tonight. We have coming on, I'm going to bring her on right now. We have Kristen, who is Philly Girl Fishing on YouTube. Kristen, how are you doing today? Good, good. How are you guys? Doing well, doing well. I'm doing great. I'm excited that you're on. For those that that haven't followed this uh live stream before it came over to salt strong you were a guest and i was unfortunate uh unfortunately not able to be on that one so we've never actually met uh, right, right. And so i'm excited i listened to the uh the live stream while i was watching my son play in a uh a playoff soccer game in the spring so i, I had two things going on at once there and man there's so many things i just want to talk to you about and yeah. and we're in the middle of tog season Yes, we are. And that is one of your just, I mean, you you slay Maybe. those tog. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I just got back from a trip to Rhode Island yesterday. And it's, it's one of those trips that you just, you just, you know, you live for. To see that many double digits come up at one time, it's like, what? So, yeah, definitely, definitely having fun. That's awesome. Yeah, so we're going to go through, everyone, a, uh, I guess, really just a season update with how you're doing, where you've been fishing, because you fished all, you don't just fish out your back door like Ed does. You know, Ed, if Ed drives more than 15 minutes, he calls it a road trip. Hey, listen, <laughs> don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> right. There's yeah, a house well, right down the street for sale. <laughs> Chris, yeah, Kristen, Kristen is driving, what, five, six hours? I don't know how yeah. you, you must be getting a lot of hotel yeah. rooms, either that or you're just yeah. crazy. That or I'm kind of crazy. No, that, 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 yesterday's trip was a, a one drive. Like, I literally left midnight Sunday morning and got back home about 1030 at night. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. that's difficult. I yeah, I saw. Well, you were in Rhode Island yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> fishing Block <laughs> Island yesterday. So I mean, that's you, dedication. You got to go to where the fish are. 
You got to go is, to where the fish are. So. That is true. That's keep, my motto. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> I agree with you. I keep trying to tell Ed, maybe he'll listen to you. He doesn't listen to me about Come anything. So Road trip. <laughs> Hey, yep. here, here comes his excuse. Figure something out and I'll make it happen. How's that? Okay. Sound? Yeah, All we'll, right. we'll see about it. that. Sounds I'm not good. against it, but when I have the bet, pretty pretty darn good fishing in my backyard, why why, why leave? I mean, in, in my defense, right, I have to travel to get the salt water regardless. So it's kind of like, yes, if I lived in Jersey, would I be as inclined to actually go and travel to other states? Maybe, maybe not. But so if I already have to backwards. drive an hour to get to the water, I might as well go ahead and make it three, four, and get to the where the fishing is really good. I will say, New Jersey togging is a lot more difficult than Rhode Island. Uh, I would right. definitely say that. Yeah. Yeah, we had uh, well, we had Captain Halkius on, and and he was, I think it was him, where he was saying it's almost just like, or no, I think it was actually uh, Frank Mahalik who said, you know, when you're up there, it's just kind of like drop and and you know, just every drop you're reeling in a fish. He said it's like fishing in an aquarium. And, uh, Almost. I mean, yeah, there are some dead, there are dead times, yeah. but, but compared to New Jersey, you know, it, it does feel like that. It's like, oh, look, this, I literally, the, the last video I just put up, I put some crab on the hook and within, I don't know, five, 10 seconds, I already felt my rod tip going like that and boom, pull up a seven pounder. So like that kind of stuff does not happen on a regular in New Jersey. At least I haven't experienced it. I mean, let me rephrase no. it that way. Right. Definitely not uh, today. <laughs> well, I, I saw that video and I was, um, it was a great video, by the way. And I, I knew you were kind of nuts because you started, uh, if it was the last one, you started in the dark in your car yeah. uh, and you were, you were driving, or I guess you were sitting there waiting to get on. Waiting. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah. So you were there for a while, but man, that it was, you were just bringing them in one after another. What did you have? Nine or 10 keepers by the end? I had 17. 17? 17. And that's generous. There were some that were like, eh, maybe they were. They might have been 16-ish, so I just didn't even count them. But yeah, that was like the most bananas type of fishing day for Tug I've ever had, um, which beat the time when I went a month ago and caught 15. Um, so yeah, that was just uh, for the first fish to be, you know, eight pounds, go to the second fish to be seven pounds, that kind of Fishing, honestly, for me, because this is the second year of me doing talk fishing, it's going to be practice. And I always tell anybody, especially, you know, y'all see the guitars behind me, like a lot of this is muscle memory. So it's like if you don't get the practice of what the little bites feel like differentiating between the smaller fish and the bigger fish, it's really hard to figure out what works, what doesn't work and what's good and what's, you know, what's not. Well, I'll tell you what, we I'm looking at the chat as you're talking and there are a lot of people that agree. Um, with, with a lot of the things that have been said already for, I mean, we've got people from all over, first of all. Um, so I, you know, I see Jack West in there, James Flynn, crabbing and fishing. We have Antonio from Boston. So Antonio, good to see yeah. you here. Um, mm -hmm. John Hutchinson, evil genius, uh, who is, <laughs> he's a member of, he's a salt strong insider from Delaware. And we've got a bunch of other people, but, you know, there was a good point brought up there that there are a lot of people that live right on the coast, Ed, that never go fishing. So maybe they should move out, drop those property values, and I'll move on in. Hey, I'll we'll move there, that. too. It's, it's me. affordable. My area is affordable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to look into that. Chris and I, we can move down and be neighbors. We'll come down. Yeah. And, yeah, and we'll move far away we from Ed in New Jersey. Life. Yeah, we'll move far away, so he has to move closer to us instead of us moving. I was here him. first. I was here first. <laughs> All right, so let's let's jump into this. So, Kristen, let's let's start with people that aren't familiar with you, ha who haven't seen your channel yet. Uh, why don't you talk about what range you're looking for when you're looking to book a trip to go out and fish for tog? Yep. So generally, I actually started when I started fishing for tog out of state. The first trip was Rhode Island. Um, Went on the fish finders trip last October, went on an island current and caught two keepers for me not knowing anything of what I was doing. Like that was impressive for me. I was like, oh yeah, I'm coming back here. Um, so generally I'm going from either Rhode Island. I haven't gotten a chance to fish uh, Montauk yet, but I, I hear that that's also pretty good. Like fishing along Long Island Sound kind of area. And then obviously Jersey is the closest place to me. And then Delaware, those are the, the three, four-ish main places I've kind of been fishing or looking to fish. Um, since I've been doing some talk fishing. So have you made it down to Maryland? Not yet. I have a trip booked. Okay. Fingers crossed. The weather stays good. I don't want to bring it up too much. And I'm like, I just I just want to get down there. But Maryland, from what I hear, is pretty much 
like the mecca of the biggins. Like you will, it, fifteen yeah. and sixteen pounders is not out of the ordinary to go in Maryland. You know. Right. Well, I yeah, I was gonna say let's let's get something together and grab a few other people because and there's a let's specific do boat down there. I'm not gonna mention it. Um, that I, I'd like to get out on it might be the one you're looking at too. <laughs> might be, might be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah they, they, so I mean, anywhere, but but the TOG even go, don't worry, Ed, you're coming. I'm going <laughs> to drive down and pick you up and bring you down with me. So. Oh, now you want to chat? No, <laughs> no, no. Robbie, Robbie's, Robbie shouted me out, so I was waving to him. I'm, oh, okay. I'm oh, not okay. sure oh, who okay. he is, but hello, Robbie. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I so the tog though the the range of them so they're going a lot further south. So we actually have people down in Virginia, yeah. um, you know, the, the Bay Bridge is a is a really good spot, um, mm -hmm. all the way down to Virginia Beach, all the way up the coast. And there's yeah. there's different seasons. So what are you looking at right now as far as? Well, it sounds like the bite in Rhode Island is still on fire. Still pretty good, actually, and that's what the captain was telling me yesterday. He said they they get a lot of big fish. In December. So Rhode Island's tog season is going to end on the 31st, I believe. So a lot of the party boats are pretty much kind of wrapping up in this next week or two. Um, that and then weather, it's just been, we've been getting so much gale force winds. I'll tell you what, I don't think I've had, and a couple of friends were saying this, so many trips canceled, like in the last two months, it just seems like six weeks or so. It's just been so many storms. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, Right now it's Rhode Island, but then obviously Jersey, we have a little bit more time. So I'm going to try to get a couple trips in Jersey. And then, like I said, Maryland in January. So after January for me, like this is, this is still pretty cold for me. I think y'all in some of my videos I have made mention, I don't really handle cold very well. I just really enjoy the tog bite and <laughs> I'm like, I'm toughing through it. Wearing like five layers and hand yeah. warmers and all types of, of nonsense just to try to stay warm. But, um, yeah, I think like probably mid January is probably where I tap out. <laughs> All right, so we'll we'll get out there before then, or we'll find some place with a heated rail and a nice warm cabin. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. when you don't mind when the boat moves a lot, you know, because exactly. everybody gets to run inside. We had a uh, a picture from I think it was two years ago now. I was, I was out on a trip with uh, John Creeley. Well, you know John, and yeah. um, he's going to be on in a few weeks also when. Uh, for oh. another episode, by the way, but uh, we were out there and it was so cold. We weren't even thinking about it. And this spray was hitting the rods and every single rod that was outside was totally frozen over. I mean, totally wow. frozen, like, like ridiculous frozen. We luckily people noticed we had to run out there, grab all the rods and bring them into the heat. And it took, it took what 15 20 minutes to get them all de-iced so people could fish so luckily wow. we did it in yep. time to you know <laughs> we could still yeah. fish yeah but that to me that i love that i love that weather so y'all are crazy yeah. it's too cold, it's too cold. <laughs> that is too cold. i, need, I, I went out in yeah electric mitts or something i went out in february this year went out on the jamaica too this is when they're doing like their 12 i think it's 12 12 14 hour trips yeah and I, you know, I had a little cabin fever. I hadn't fished since like the first week in January. I said, I'm going to do it. I think the temperature was probably maybe 28 was the high. Yeah. And that's not including the wind chill. The worst decision I feel like I've made fishing ever. I caught <laughs> one short. I was <laughs> probably turning Fishing. shades of purple and red from the cold. I just, I was so miserable. I was like, yep. Nope. Fishing I was, all I was your sitting life in my decisions. car. Right? Exactly. I was sitting in the car waiting to get on the boat, like trying to stay warm before you get on the boat. And the gentleman parked next to me, we both got out the car. He said, what's wrong with us? I said, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out myself. But I hope we have a good day to make this all worth it. Yeah. And then, and then to have oh, a difficult man. day, that's, that's yeah. the worst. Yeah. But you know what? But when Look, they bite, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. There, there are a lot of people in here in this chat right now and watching that are from all over the place and they fish the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. And I can't, I get a bet right now. Actually, I'll ask people in the chat, put in the chat if this is not true for you. If you can't say this quote, I have made some very questionable decisions when hitting the water, fishing the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. And I bet you nobody says, not me. <laughs> I bet you everybody yeah. does it at some point because we have the difficult. It's not like Texas, you know, where you can fish and, and, you know, it's, it's nice and cold right now for them, but they're, this is where they're yeah. catching the big fish, you know, they're on the mm -hmm. big reds and, 
and you know they got the flounder bite going and and the uh, the speckled trout. It's not like that. I mean, this, this is like it's kind of torture. <laughs> mm -hmm. Self inflicted. <laughs> self-inflicted but bit. you know it's, it's like the scars that you're proud of you know you come home and you can't you can't you know move your fingers for a while you, you're yep. happy for yep. that long car ride back to philadelphia because mm -hmm. that's what's going to get you back to the land of the living yep yep well, yeah. nice and warm i did have a nice little scissor snip me cutting crab yesterday on my finger so we, we have we get wounds every once in a while hooks and one, one guy was trying to flip a fish that ended up being bigger than he thought i think it was like five six pounds almost broke his rod tip so i just instinctively reach over and i like, grab the line and flip it over so now i have a nice little braid cut in my uh, in uh my finger but th those are the battle scars that you know makes it makes it worth it it's like hey man we're catching fish so it's a good time yeah i mean for tog fishing you're going to get those you're going to get a lot of those right and and tog are you know they're they're going to stick you too uh with those fins and they're so slippery oh, yeah. but um it's kind of like the striper thumb with tog you know, you get the scissors oh, yeah. and the crabs and, you know, you get cut up grabbing the leaders and everything like that. Well, not That's even that. The juices from them crabs, they tear my hands apart. Yeah. yeah. It's like acid. It's mm -hmm. like acid hitting your hands. Mm -hmm. All right. So mm -hmm. so you're fishing pretty much the entire coast. We're going to get you down to Maryland yeah. at some point. Yeah. Hopefully your trip goes off um, and you yep. get out there and get the new world record out of, uh, hey, out of Ocean I like City. It. I like it. Yeah. Mr. Westerfield, she's coming for you. Um, <laughs> so, so let's go through your last four or five trips where, so you yeah. let's talk about the Rhode Island one, because that was the most recent. So where yeah. were you fishing? What boat were you fishing? And, uh, yep. you know, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, um, was fishing with wise cracking charters. Uh, this was on this six pack boat. So not on the Stella Sea, but on the Laura Ann. So that was my first time on this boat. Um, I had seen, I didn't even see, honestly, got interested in fishing in Rhode Island because of fishing grubs. Like he was a yeah. mate on that boat before. I was watching his YouTube videos and I said, oh, well, they have some pretty good fishing. I got to try to get up there. So finally got the opportunity to do it. Um, the bite in Newport, Rhode Island really died evidently from the last couple of big blows that they had the previous week. Um, I was in fishing out of Newport the week before, the weekend before. Um, so this was like one of the few boats that actually went out. I know a lot of guys whose trips got canceled in Rhode Island one Sunday because of the wind. But um, yep, we made it through the sound, got to Block Island. Immediately, as soon as we get there, we're fish are coming over the rail in like three minutes, three, four minutes, you yeah. know? So like, I think we had a full boat limit, I wanna say by maybe, maybe 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's like, it's like three, four hours in, you know what I mean? So then we just kind of went, you know, big boy hunting or big girl hunting. And, and uh, we, we joked that one drop that we called a Jurassic Park because we literally dropped down within five minutes of getting to the drop, three double digit tall come up. I think it was an 11 and a half, a 10 and a half, and a 10.3, something like that. Wow. I catch a five pounder and I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. so close. Like I keep <laughs> being next to the guy catching the 10 pound fish and I'm just like, so close. But uh, then we had a guy who caught an eight pounder. So it was actually pretty funny. And this, I'm probably going to include that in the video. That, that's going to be two videos from now. But um, he caught an eight pounder and they were going to go take the picture. And he was like, can I get in the picture? And they're like, no, your fish is too small. I didn't make the same fish cut. See you later. But it was, it was pretty hilarious. He's like, man, like caught an eight pound fish and I can't get in the big fish picture. That doesn't um, happen but, uh, often. That, it does. It does not. It does. Like, right. And I was mad. I pulled up a six pounder. Like any other time, especially in New Jersey, I don't even think I've kept caught a six pounder in New Jersey. To be honest, I say the six is my personal best in Jersey. Yeah, you know, like a six is something to be excited about in New Jersey. So, yeah, it's it's one of those things where you you catching an eight a six pound fish and you're like, oh, this sucks. This is sh like you know, like it's so crazy the perspective change when you go, when you travel somewhere. So. Two trips before that, I had went and fished um, New Jersey. And uh, when I put that video up, I remember a guy saying in the comments, he was like, man, I'd be mad if I went on a trip and only caught two keepers. I said, <laughs> this is New Jersey. I'm excited. <laughs> I, I had to go back through my like my catch list and say, this is the first New Jersey trip I actually caught two keepers. You know what? I'm pat myself on the back. Like, hey, I did yeah. it. Because this New Jersey is, is definitely not as easy. So, yeah, a, a quite quite a bit of a contrast uh between new jersey's opening season weekend i couldn't make it out on opening day I had to work but uh 
and then being in Rhode Island. So yeah, that last trip, I think we had yesterday's trip had I want to say five double digits on the trip. Uh, one guy caught two of them, like to the point where by the time at the end of the day when we were still hunting for Big Bertha, that's what I called it, the big girls. Yeah. Uh, he just like, can I get clam? Because I want to catch cod. Like it, either <laughs> if you caught two double digits, you're just like, yeah, I'm ready to ready to catch another species. So yeah. <laughs> did everybody did everybody mug his spot? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, did we? Man, me and my friend actually mugged them. That he just was like, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and fish on the other side. We're like, no, 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 come back! Like, I, we didn't want to kick out your spot, but I mean, if you're going to leave and make room for us, we'll take it. <laughs> That's great. I mean, it's funny, you know, you're saying you have a six pounder, and uh, it's not often, as you said, in New Jersey. If you have a six pounder, you're in that picture. You have that six pounder. Yeah. They're turning around. They're like, Kristen, can you take the picture for us? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. You're not allowed anywhere near it. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Um, so, okay. So that's, that's Rhode Island. Now talk a little bit about the, the area that you're fishing around block. Obviously I'm not, you, I doubt you know them, yeah. but I'm not going to ask for spots, but what, yeah. what was the depth and what were you, were using rigs? Were you using jigs? Oh yeah. So that was interesting. So this is the first time I actually talk fish in Black Island. I fished Black Island for fluke. Uh, a couple of times through the summertime. So we were actually fishing pretty deep and we were mainly fishing kind of like either boulders or ledges. So those big fish were living on boulder, um, which is cool. I like that because you're a lot less likely to get snagged. Yeah. I'm trying to think. I probably only lost a couple of rigs. There's a couple of times I got snagged, but it's not one of the snaggiest places. But we, we kind of went between reefs to, you know, a rocky area to a couple of different spots with boulders. So we fished the whole gamut, um, and then from a range of depths, I think the shallowest we, we fished was probably about 55 feet, and the deepest was about 100. So that was uh, interesting because I said, you know, I, I want to always try to, you know, challenge myself. So I, like, I still want to try jigging deep. Never jigged that deep before. Um, I did manage to pull up two fish on the jig. One was probably about four and a half, five pounds, and the other one was the picture that I had put up on Instagram. It was probably five and a half ish, pushing six ish, six ish. Um, so that bigger fish, but uh i was not i definitely struggled with the jig in the deeper water it's it's completely different and fishing for the fish in general in deeper water i definitely noticed the difference in the fight uh, it's almost like it almost feels like they give it way easier you know, i could imagine they're probably getting exhausted from coming up you know, from so deep so fast right um so it's kind of like you get them like through once you get past that first third of the water column wherever they're you know living at that depth and it seemed like it was kind of easy and just kind of dead weight and you just kind of pull them up. So yeah, definitely deeper water. Okay. All right. And, and the trip before that, well, you were also up in, in Rhode Island. Where was the last trip that you were not up in Rhode Island? The last one was that New Jersey opening weekend. So that was like three weeks ago. Yeah. yeah. About three weeks ago. Yep. Okay. And how, and how did you do on that one? That one was two keepers, uh, seven shorts. I think two people seven shorts. So again, I'm counting shorts because this is New Jersey and I will count shorts for Jersey. Um, so yeah, that wasn't too bad. I was fishing next to a guy who was absolutely slaying it. You know, I was like, the captain was like, yeah, I wouldn't fish next to him if I were you. I'm like, well, at least I'll, I'll get a clinic and, and learn because it was just like, as soon as he would drop down, he was getting bites. And what was very interesting was he was using a conventional rod turned backward, like using a spinning reel on a conventional rod and he still caught like seven or eight keepers. So I guess it kind of goes to show like, if you know what your gear feels like and you know what that fish bite feels like, you can, it's literally like you can catch them on anything. I mean, it was a good ride. I think it was the Shimano Terramar, um, which I know well, one of my friends, she fishes with that too. That's one of her but favorite rides. he put a spinning rides. reel was, on it? He had a spinning reel on it. But it still had the trigger. So. Why, why did he do that? He I just wanted know. to use the rod? I, I, I have no idea, but it, but he was killing it. He was one of the high hooks for the yeah. day on that trip. And what was interesting, I was fishing starboard side. I normally fish starboard. In the morning, it was just a, it was a port side bite. I was on that was when I was on the Osprey down in Atlantic City. And I, I'm kind of hard headed on spots. Like if I pick a spot, I kind of want to just fish it for that day. Um, and I went waited too long to move to the other side of the boat. But in the morning, like we had one guy. I forgot how many keepers he had. I think he had like 10 keepers or something crazy, port side bow, and he was just killing it. So that's the thing, like with the bigger party boats, 
Sometimes it's just the spots. It depends on where the fish are sitting, depending on the wind that day. They might just be living on that side of the reef or the wreck or the rocks. And if you're on the other side of a big, you know, 80 foot boat, unless you get that spot and start mugging people, it might be hard for you to get that, those fish. Yeah. Are you, are you fishing towards the back or towards the front or the middle? Yeah. yeah. This time I did the back. A lot of times as it get colder, I tend to fish the back to kind of hide from the wind a little bit. Um, yeah. Fluke season, um, I'm bow all day. Like I rarely ever fish the sherm, but I, I I generally stay at the back of the boat in in a cold time, cold season. Gotcha. What what boat did you go out on when you went out in New Jersey? Uh, that was on the Osprey. Yeah, so the okay. Osprey that comes down from New York down in Atlantic yeah. City. What did they have uh, conch for bait? No, I don't think I saw anybody using that. But the cool thing about Osprey is that they have whites, so you don't have to mm-hmm. pay extra for white layers. Um, but most of the fish were biting, at least in my area, the guys I was fishing with, everybody was using whites. I don't think people were really using greens too much. I went on Osprey, was it last year or the year before, and they had conch. So the guys were in the back mm. of the boat banging on, trying to break the <laughs> shells. It sounded like they were building a yeah. house on the back of the boat. Yeah. They have conch, go to the front. <laughs> yeah, Ed's not a fan uh, of that. Oh, it's so loud. Really? It was terrible. Yeah. It sounded yeah. like they were building a house was all day. Mm. Mm-mm-mm. So we, I was out on the 17th. So right before you were out, um, you were probably out around the 19th. Then, if yeah, I, I think it was 19th. Yeah. Okay. So we, we ended up going out and it was really difficult, but th- there was a bite. There was a difficult bite for Tog. And uh, we ended up just catching a whole ton. Of, I, I'm conservatively estimating this at, at a minimum of 250 striped bass <laughs> through, wow. through the blitzes. Did, did you guys do any of that on the Osprey or were you just talk no, all day? That no, day? we, yep. Stay committed. I think, I know the smaller boats were doing that a lot, doing a combination of yeah. the, of the tog and the striped bass. Cause the striped bass is just, it's so good. Cause the water's been so warm. We're still hanging out. Um, so yeah, but no, we just did, stuck straight to tog. Okay. Yeah. That was my, my only tog fishing so far. So we did a good, amount of it there were some nice tog pulled up um you know i had a keeper and a, a few of the you know the shorts i also count them uh yeah. <laughs> but you I'm know in new jersey <laughs> no no yeah. I, I i count them i didn't count the striper i had to i was working on the video and it wasn't until i went through the video editing that i i saw how many i caught um but yeah. i didn't i didn't keep track during the day um, but it's been an interesting, interesting year in Jersey. And you haven't been down to Delaware yet this year, right? Haven't been yet. I'm supposed to be this week. So again, fingers crossed. If the weather holds up, then that is the plan. So hopefully we'll we'll have that. But I did fish in Delaware two times in the spring and then last December. So the Delaware bite has, has been pretty good too. Um, again, still it seems like a lot more opportunity to kind of get more bites in Delaware um, than in Jersey. But um, it's still pretty good. I, I enjoy fishing and, and definitely fishing. And it's only two and a half hours from my house. So that's a lot, a lot more probable than, uh, than that five, six hour drive up north. Yeah. You know what's interesting, though, about Delaware? A lot of times they'll fish the same spots as the Cape May fleet, uh, South yes. Jersey. So, you know, mm-hmm. talk about what Reef Site 11 and, and mm-hmm. all of those. They're, they're heading way out and uh, they kind of yeah. meet. They meet out there. Um, yeah. I, I have not been down there for, for Tog yet. I love fishing Delaware. Delaware to me is just, it's, it, well, first of all, there's not a ton of backwater that, that yeah. you can fish down there, at least not compared to New Jersey. So, but out front, I love it out front. And I've always loved the Delaware Bay, even though it's half a dead zone <laughs> these days, I still love it. Um, yeah. So I plan on getting down there. So when you were out there, so, all these trips, are you typically, you know, you mentioned you were catching some fish on a jig. Are you typically yep. using rigs? And if you're using rigs, what rigs are you using? Yeah, rigs. Um, I'm definitely more comfortable with rigs, but I think it's honestly just because that's what I started on. Um, but while I'm still fresh at it is why I'm challenging myself to learn a jig so I don't get stuck in just one method of fishing. Because I, I do feel like a lot of the trips I, I've been on in New Jersey, probably from what, last November, up through now, a lot of the guys that were catching the majority of the fish were on a jig. Um, I was just reading the post, was it Mohawk or Os- or Explorer, Ocean Explorer? I don't remember, but one of the boats were saying how it was mainly a jig bite today. 
Um, and that's the guys that were using the jigs were the most successful. So it's one of those things where if the conditions allow it, that's when I'm kind of get practice. I think Delaware was the first place where I was kind of able to really start practicing and, and bringing up fish. And then I had a really good trip in Rhode Island last month where a lot of my fish were on the jig, but it's like the, the current thing is, is the biggest piece for me. Like when it's slack tied, it's a lot easier for me to feel the bite. I've been playing around with like different line sizes and like talking to different friends and different YouTubers. Like, what are you guys using on your jig setup? Because, you know, sometimes it feels like I can feel everything. I'm doing good. And then other times it's like, I can't tell if I'm on the bottom. Like, you know, because right. especially with the jig bite, some, a lot of times the fish will just pick it up and swim away with it. And actually in the, was it the last video that that second fish that I had caught, no, the first one, the first one, I barely, I barely felt it, but I also had um, 30, 30 pound braid on. I had just got a, a new reel. I got the sauces and everybody, all my, you know, my, the guys I fish with, the fish finders guys are like, you need to use 30 pound braid. Da, 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 da. So I'm like, all right, I'll beef it up. I'll try 30, but I just did not feel comfortable with 30. Like to go from 15 to 30, I felt a great difference. And I was like, nah, I'm going back to 15. So when I fished yesterday, I used 15 pound braid, usually the 30 pound liter. Sometimes I'll bump it up to 40, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially with the jig, you know, it, you can lose contact with the bottom. The jig's on the bottom, but you're losing contact because you have such a bow in that line. So when you're, mm -hmm. when you're pulling it, you're just pulling the slack in, you know, but it's, yeah. it looks tight. It feels tight until you start mm -hmm. reeling it. And then you'll feel the, you know, you'll, you'll know this is happening when you're snagged. And you're, yeah. you get to reel a few turns. So you brought in 10, 15 feet and all of a sudden you're snagged. You're like, well, I should have felt that. Now it's because you yeah. have that heavy line. I, I'll say I'll say that when we were out there catching all those striped bass, I was using 10 pound test and we were catching, you know, there were most of them were were keeper size. Right. So they were up to 38. Yeah. Uh, the vast majority of them, there were some under, um, you know, in the mid 20s. And there were some that were over. I had a couple that were overs, all on 10 pound test, right? So if you're gonna jig 10 pound test, 15 pound test, it's all it's all the leader that's gonna save you from yeah. breaking off. It has nothing to do with yeah. the line because yep. when you're pulling a 25 pound bass, you can certainly pull in a 25 pound tog uh, with yeah. that. Maybe go to 15 then if you wanna get a world record. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say the exact same thing, Rich. The yeah, I mean- yeah, it's the it's the drag on the line, and and a lot of people don't realize that, you know. And I think yeah. part of it is a lot of people come from bass fishing, you know, freshwater. Mm -hmm. They're throwing 50, 65 pound braid on there yeah. so they can That's rip it through the throw. lily pads. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, look, they hook it and they just reel it. They don't, you know, <laughs> they just reel it in. Yeah. They rip it, yeah. rip the lily pads out. Uh, Another key mm -hmm. piece of that too is is the drag on your reel, getting your drag mm -hmm. on your reel set right. You can fight yeah. a fifty pound fish on ten pound, no problem. Yeah, if the reel's yep. right. Absolutely. I'll, I'll give the, the story. My grandfather back in the day caught a uh, 70, I think it was 76, 72 pound black drum. And he was on 10 pound wow. test. Wow. Uh, on a flounder like rod. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it took him two hours. Um, just at the time, he it was it. almost a state record. He missed by a couple ounces. Yeah. But um, it just goes to show if you know how to fight it and you have, mm -hmm. you know, the right drag set and the right leader and everything you're fine he ended up boating it they ended up keeping it god we had drum forever i was just a kid at the time <laughs> but, you know the, the the line when you're jigging does need to get scaled down now what yeah. what rod are you using when you're out there fishing in the in the fall and and is it different than yeah. in the spring yeah so i would say well i keep my rods pretty much the same all the way through so um, my favorite rod right now has been my Phoenix Titan, and it's a, a long fall version of that rod. So that's a 710 heavy. Um, I think it can throw like, I don't know, between like 60 ounces to 17 ounces. So I've used it for a fluke. I've used it on Amberjack when I was fishing down in North Carolina. I'm using it for tog. That thing to me is like my jack of all trades, like that I'm going for that rod. And I've gotten, I've been fishing it so long now for the, for the year in different species. I've gotten real comfortable on what it feels like when you know, I have different types of fish on and what that bite is. So what's cool about it is it has a really sensitive tip, but it's a really, really, really strong stiff backbone. Where as long as I load that thing up, either setting the hook high enough when I'm tog fishing or on any other fish where it's bending over in half and, and, and kind of, you know, using that backbone, 
I, you know, I don't have to worry about working too hard for the hook set. So that's, I would say that's my go-to rig ride. Um, I've been bouncing back and forth with like, what's my backup rig ride and then my, my jigging rod. So the jigging rod I've been using the last um, month or so that I picked up is a, a black hole charter special, six foot eight. And it's one of their more affordable ones. So that's like 200s. It's the guys yep. that know black hole stuff, that stuff can go up to the roof, like 500, 600 dollars. Right. So this one, um, it can, th- it's supposed to throw two to six ounces. I wish it was like one to four. Like if it was one to four, then it would be like perfect, perfect, perfect. I came from using a, uh, a tsunami, I think it's like trophy series or something. And that was rated one to four ounces. So I loved the sensitivity of that. It right. was a little bit lighter. Um, but unfortunately I was on a boat, a mate tied a uni to uni with 50 pound braid and well, snapped a, a guide. I tried to fix the guide and I was like, yeah, I was getting a new ride. So that's why I went when I got the, the black pole. Um, but what's cool about that though, it's pretty light. I have that paired with a, a, a 3000 sauces and literally I did like the one finger balance test. That thing, I can balance it on one finger, very, very light, but really good back. So I would say those are kind of like the two main setups that I use we have um andrew sokol putting this out there the century pro togger that that's his recommendation that's obviously frank mahalik's yeah. because frank designed yeah. it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um i, I will I, say I know that, a lot of guys use those yep yeah i i actually frank let me use uh, one of his and i know i want to make a distinction there there is a difference between pro toggers the pro togger is actually the blank the frank mahalik's Pro Togger is actually the one that's built by the uh, the advanced fishing team. That's the actual real one with the exact components and measurements and and everything. Uh, so there's a difference. I have to say, Andrew, I love my custom rod um, that I use for Tog. I absolutely love it. I don't have one complaint. When I used the Century Pro Togger, it was a different level. It was, uh, yeah. it was, it was really good. Frank knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing when he put that together. And I know they spent yeah. a couple of years doing it, but, um, it, it's definitely a good one. And it's, it's similar to the description that you gave Kristen, where it has the backbone, but it has that sensitivity and you don't have to work incredibly hard for that hook set. And, and I've yeah. noticed in your videos, you have a very, what I'll call shallow hook set. You're not, yeah. you're not slamming it and you're not, you know, whereas if, if you miss it, you're falling over backwards, like half the people do myself yeah. included, yeah. Uh, by the way, I'm one of those guys. <laughs> um, you have a very, um, fluid and quick short set, which, which makes it, which I think is why that rod that you're using works so well for you, because you can see the backbone yeah. kicks right in. Like you're, you're setting that hook in inches. Yeah. You know? I probably need about, it's literally like that. It's as soon as I get it tucked in my arm and it probably goes up about three feet. Generally I have it. I mean, unless I'm like oh, out of balance. Sometimes like if I'm, I'm high sticking a little bit higher than I really should be, depending yeah. on like my balance on the boat. Those are the times when I'm going all the way up. But most of the time, if I'm steady and balanced and my rod tip is pointed down like that, all I got to do is go about this high. I'm trying to get my hand in the camera this high and I'm good. It sets up. Yeah. That's that efficient hook set. That's, that's kind of how I feel about the Nexus rods too. The Jigging World ones that I use, they the hook set comes in, or the back run, I should say, loads up real fast. So I don't have to do, you know, real crazy, as L says, Jimmy Houston hook sets. That's me. <laughs> or or Bassmaster definitely... Pro hook sets. That's what I call those. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I do those. I don't know why. I do them on everything. Uh, it's, uh, but I have to, I have to use the rods to uh, uh, accommodate for my over setting. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'll use a softer tip quite often uh, or and actually yeah, I see the problem when I go fishing for weak fish. I have to consciously tell myself I'm fishing for weak fish. I can't do that hook set. And I use mm-hmm. a softer tip because, you know, it'll rip right through. It'll, I mean, it'll, it'll rip, rip right, right through their mouth. Have yeah. you ever had a fish like yeah. land in your lap from doing that? No. Um, <laughs> actually, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that was that was freshwater. That was freshwater panfish. <laughs> so that was perch. <laughs> yeah, I I was like, a... You're hook setting on panfish. <laughs> I, 
I, I can't so help it, Kristen. And this is with, oh, this I is can't with wait a to little perch fishing with you. <laughs> this is with a, uh, it was with one of those uh, little ugly stick ultralight trout rods too. Yeah. So it doesn't even have any backbone. And no. boy, did that thing come flying out of the water straight at me, straight at me. And I was in the kayak oh, too. So there's hilarious. nowhere to go. The only thing you can do is this. And it comes up and you hopefully it hits off your hand. But yeah, yeah. I got I it on video say, too. You had brought up oh my bad. I was just like, Ed, uh, you had brought up the jigging world. I, my backup uh rig ride has been the black demon. So okay. medium heavy. Um again, seven that one's seven five or seven six, but I like that one too. That one's a really pretty solid. It's definitely it it the action uh technically I think it's more moderate. The terms Sometimes I even get mixed up with it, moderate fast, but it bends over. Bad rod bends over in half in a U, mm -hmm. um, and so it definitely goes further down. Whereas the the Titan has a little bit less tip and a little bit more backbone, but that's still a solid rod. I've been liking that too. Now, do you use a different rod versus uh, rig versus jig? Like, do you have different, oh, or yeah. do you use the same? Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm conventional. Most of the time, I'm conventional all the time. Actually, me fishing spinning has been kind of, I usually only do that when I'm pure fishing or fishing from the land. Um, and so kind of going back to, to, to going to a spinning setup on a boat has been a little bit different for me because normally I'll just use a little low profile bait caster and, you know, maybe the the actual slow pitch uh, Phoenix Titans, I, I use those. And um, that will be, that used to be my first like jig setup that I was switching up to. So now I switched it to using spinning for the jigging and then sticking with conventional for rigs and that works for me it's just easier to me really to fight the fish where if i need to use the rod as leverage and lay it on the rail i like having that flexibility as opposed to when i'm spinning my arms are kind of up higher all the mm -hmm. time through the, through the duration of the bite what do you think of that ed you like spinning i like spinning in the kayak yeah and on a boat like today i used i had Two conventional setups i had my jigging world for uh, i had a one to four ounce uh, nexus that i used for the jig and then i had my custom from john um that i used for the rigs and um in the kayak i prefer the spinning rods because they i feel like it's easier to set the hook i, I hold the rod lower so it's easier to set versus with this conventional you're kind of crossed up with it so it, it makes it a little weird I don't know. That's just the way I do things, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I personally like the conventional, but I use a low profile bait caster. I do like that. However, I and I'll insist it's my favorite until I use the spinning gear again, and and then I miss the spinning gear. So I could go either way with that. Um, I'm still stuck on that guy using the uh, the conventional rod upside down with the spinning. It, yeah, that's... and having a good day. And he, it wasn't like he wasn't, he was catching more. I, I'm like, yeah. every maybe time just I'm looking, look over, he catching a fish. And maybe I, I think a lot spinning blank and what he wanted or something. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's be yeah. honest. If, if the ride is, if the rod is not splined, which most manufacturers don't do anymore, apparently it doesn't matter. Oh. It, it's a casting rod versus spinning rod. It's probably virtually mm. the same if it's not splined. If it is splined, okay. then it's going to want to turn over in your hand. You know, mm -hmm. um, so maybe you couldn't afford it. I mean, look, the, none of these things That's are cheap. Yeah. Which no, is why I use a $200 reel instead of what you use, Kristen. <laughs> and you put Tog in front of I anything. get that all the time. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh. <laughs> so I like I like when things to match. And I like pretty nice things. What, so you and say? you and Creeley <laughs> must get along. John Creeley must get along Just really fine. well. Yeah. yeah. He to tries him, to stretch my budget. I should get yeah. a pro talker. I'm supposed to get what else am I going to get? The Mag Junior. Uh, yeah. If I if I if I left my fishing budget in his hands, he'll come back with a, a $3,500 tab. I'm sure in no time. Uh, you'd be broke. <laughs> Within seconds, you'd have pink, uh, pink, blue, and green Abbott reels. You would have all that stuff. Yep. yep. Yeah. He 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 says that to him. Uh, his equipment are also accessories. <laughs> so. Yeah. They are, you know. Uh, I do remember that I was on Wisecracking, and uh, Kevin Johnny saw saw the Max L and the Phoenix Titan. He was like, "You got the rod and the reel to match perfectly." And I like, I'm not gonna lie, I picked up the saltist to match the black hole because I was like, "Black and blue reel, 
I think I think that has to be it. It's it's yep. I wanted the excuse to buy the real and it matches, so I had to buy the real. So yeah. Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> hey, if you can afford it, it's a good reel and it looks good, you may as well get it. I, yeah. I have to put a pause on this conversation because I'm gonna show this one comment from Robbie Gilliam. I can outfish Rich. If not, I'll get his haircut. Okay, you can make fun of my haircut. That's fine. I think I think that Robbie doesn't believe that we're alive. So he's been throwing a whole bunch of things in the chat. So oh, wanted to just bring okay. this up here. We are live. Um, <laughs> and you might be able to outfish me, Robbie, and that's fine. But if you do, or if you do well, not, I am going to hold you to that. You're going to have to get your hair cut like mine. I think he said he was from Texas. So we'll bring him up here and put him on a tog boat in the middle of February and we'll see what, what his oh, warm yeah. blood itself could do. Let's yeah. See how he can aim. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different thing. I've I've mentioned to the other Salt Strong coaches, I said, you know, I said to Pat Ogletree because he travels around and fishes all different states. And I said, uh, when are you coming up here? Let's do some some fall striper fishing. He looked at me like I was smoking all kinds of things. And uh, he said, I, d I don't go beyond Virginia. <laughs> He's like, that's too cold. Right, we'll get so, him up here for flounder then. I, I, I think, I think Pat, if you're watching, I think I can get him to, uh, I think I can get him to come up. So we'll, we'll give it a go. We'll try to get everybody to come up and we'll all go out together. Christian, you come with us. And, yeah, uh, let's do it. Make a day of it. Oh boy. I, I, I told Rich, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable in the kayak. I, I don't know. We had to start yeah. slow. It had to be fresh water or something where the water is not deeper than like five feet, <laughs> like baby steps. Really, yeah, really you know what? Baby steps. We don't need a kayak. Ed also has a boat. We'll just mm -hmm. go out on this. There boat. we go. Yeah, right. I have that too. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just have to drop the anchor so that we don't have to worry about spot locking or anything. Yeah, I don't have spot lock. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So I want to make sure that we have any of the questions in here, Ed. Have you kept track of some of these? I want to put uh, this one up from Bill. That's Kristen. It's Cody from the J2. So just a hello from... Hey, Cody. Cody looks exactly like Bill Clinton in his profile no. picture. <laughs> uh, John C. put up one. John C. put up one earlier. If, has anyone caught the Bergal? I don't think oh, any... Yeah self-respecting tog fisherman would admit to it but yes we've all caught yes. all. <laughs> I, caught, I caught one yesterday yep well well I, I so let me put this in there i've only caught i think one that i remember i remember the first one i ever caught and that was two years ago fishing for tog i never caught one and the only reason i caught it is because i foul hooked it and mm. I, I got it through the back and then a a, a black bass a sea bass took it a really nice one uh, so I ended up pulling in the sea bass, and there it was with the uh, the foul hooked bergal on there. So that was yeah. the first one I ever caught. Maybe I've caught two or three since then, but you know there were a lot of fish that everybody assumes that people have caught. And I've been fishing nearly 50 years: New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, North Carolina, and that was my first bergal. I've never caught a, uh, a blowfish. I have never caught a porgy. Yeah, me neither. Really? Caught a porgy. Never. Never caught I a porgy. Thought, I mean, my first porgy was, was it last last fall? Yeah. So I, it took me a while to catch a porgy too. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. Everyone thought that I was lying, but no, I I've never caught one. So you know, I can't really comment on that when people want to talk about it. Um, yeah. Uh, there's one that you put up, Rich, uh, from O Mall Mentoring. Yes. Um, someone's asking for your information, Kristen. So. Um, okay, sure thing. They would like to speak to you and have you speak to youth. So that's really oh, cool. That would be awesome. Yeah, that is cool. I love I love working with kids. So yeah, you can reach me at uh, phillygirlfishing at gmail.com for those kind of longer, more you know, intricate things. Um, for any time on the videos, if you leave a comments on videos, feel free to comment right on the videos. I'm responsive. And then also on Instagram, Philly Girl Fishing is the handle. Yes. And if you're not subscribed, I recommend it. And Absolutely. By the way, it kind of works out well. I, I won't recommend following anyone unless I also follow them. But I guess, Ed, we don't ever have people come on unless we already followed them. <laughs> so yeah. I guess it kind of works kinda. out that way. Um, yeah, I've been I've been following Kristen for a while. And uh, man, still can't believe that we haven't gotten out there. 
there's a couple of other yeah. things in here. Um, well, while you're doing that, Joe Billups wants to uh, charter out the Osprey. So, oh, I would love that. That's definitely that's one of my favorite party boats. Like, so yeah, they do work hard. I, I fished around them today, and they were pulling up anchor left and right. They were moving, trying to find fish. So, and very efficient at anchoring, which I, mm -hmm. I have to say, like, I'm 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 going on so many boats now in the last like you know year and a half, and it's you can tell the guys that really know how to anchor and, and be very efficient. I mean, you're on a party boat, you know, that could be two hours worth of the day. If, if it was taking 15 minutes to pull anchor and you pull, you know, go on a six, seven, eight spots, you know what I mean? So they're very, very good at, at what they do. Definitely a good boat. Yeah. I, I've been on the Osprey. I really like the Osprey. Um, I have also been on the boats where it takes forever for them to anchor. Been on a boat yeah. where they lost an anchor too. Uh, yep. <laughs> which see, now, really makes it a tough day. See, like they mm -hmm. should, they should do that. Like soccer, they like they count the stoppage time. So the time that they take to anchor, they should tack on to the end of the trip, so you can yeah. fish more. I agree. I would, I would love that. But <laughs> with that said, most of the good boats do it quickly, and when they don't, they those are also the the captains that'll stick stick around and and stay longer. You know, especially if yeah. it's a full day trip. If it's a full day trip, um, I've been on the Osprey when they've stayed out longer. I've been on a lot of boats where they've stayed out longer. I've been on some where they didn't move all day. Nobody caught anything all day and they yeah. went back uh, early because nothing was happening. <laughs> I was like, yeah. well, you could have burned yep. more than the three gallons of gas to go to two miles outside <laughs> of the inlet. Mm -hmm. but, yep. Um, yep. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I will say this before anyone asks what they are, they are out of business. They are no longer uh, in business. So yeah. it might be part of the reason why. I was to say, yeah, that's probably why. Yeah. Might be. Maybe. <laughs> so we're, uh, we got, I got one more question. And yeah. then uh, James Flynn was asking uh, what weight jigs for what depth? Oh, so um, I'm going to say this is going to depend highly on your setup. So for example, I think uh, John Hockey is, you know, Jig and Jerks. He just put up a video. He was fishing a hundred feet with 10 pound braid and using one ounce jig. Yeah. Now for me, I'm very, I'm still very new at using a jig. So one and a half it tends to be like a sweet spot. I feel like it's not too heavy. It's not too light. Going to that one ounce, I caught a couple of good fish on, on one ounce jigs when it was like slack tide, but I'm not as comfortable um, with the lighter jigs because you really have to be confident on like feeling the bottom and, and knowing knowing where your jigs at. So one and a half works for me. Two is like the biggest I really go. Like when I first started buying jigs, you know, I was thinking, well, let me go heavier so I know I can feel the bottom. I was thinking about it like fluke fishing. Um, I've heard, I've heard guys say, and I don't, I, maybe you guys can kind of help clarify, but heard guys say, don't use like a three ounce jig or heavier because it's going to be too heavy for the tog to think it's a crab because crabs are never going to weigh more than two ounces or whatever. So yeah, I've heard that. Besides the fact they're bulky, I, you know, it, you might as well fish a rig at that point if you're going to four ounces. So, you know, my suggestion is if you're really, really new at it, start at two ounces, but one and a half to me is a really good sweet spot. And uh, I would say I feel more comfortable fishing the jig at like 50, 60 feet. Cool. Like well, once I was getting that 90, 100 feet, I caught fish on it. Would I, was I comfortable? Did I really feel it? Mm, I kind of got lucky and was testing it and kind of lifting the rod tip a little bit to see if I had weight on it all of a sudden. And that's how I brought up that, that almost six pound fish yesterday. So. Yeah, I think it's going to depend on, again, your line weight, too. The thinner the line, the less current resistance, the more current resistant it will be. Am I saying it the right way? In other words, yeah. the current will not affect it the thinner the line is. So for me, 15-pound braid has kind of been my sweet spot. Some guys will go as low as 10, and some guys I know fish 30. So Yeah, uh, I think Halkius, if I remember correctly, uh, he said he doesn't have anything over one ounce on his boat, never will. And I believe he fishes 10 pounds. Um, yeah. you know, he goes real light noodle rods, you know, he said mm -hmm. the more noodle, the better on that rod. Yep. So he, he wants a super bendy, flexible rods, uh, kind of guess, uh, similar to the guy in your last video, Kristen, that was fishing next to you. It looked like he was going to snap yeah. his rod every single time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's a nice fish. That, that's an OT, the OTI, uh, he loves yeah. that rod and I've seen him cut, he caught another 10 pounder. That was when we were on no limit. Uh, I think I had it, it had to been, it was like 10 or 11 pounds on that rod and he even flipped it up like the guy crazy with that little noodle rod but yeah the noodle rods they are fun i will say that if you you want an exciting time 
use those because that will make even a five pound fish feel like it's a 15 pounder. Yeah. I, I, I caught a, uh, speaking of the rods that, that just have that backbone and it doesn't look like they do, but they do the, uh, the weapon junior that you, that John's mm -hmm. trying to get you to buy. I used yeah. quas and when we were out fishing the one day and, uh, I caught a striped bass on that and I could have flipped that fish. Now this thing was doubled over. I mean, yeah. totally doubled yeah. over, but it had so much backbone still in it that I could have flipped the fish mm -hmm. and it was not a small striped bass. It was probably around 30 inches. Um, so being able to flip that, you know, that's, that's yeah. some serious backbone in those. So to, uh, uh go back to the jig thing though, while still, yeah, fresh I wanted to my, go back to that too. Yeah. Go while ahead. still fresh in my brain. Cause I was fishing them today. So we fished, uh, in like 50 feet of water and like 90 feet of water. And I fished a one ounce yeah. jig in both, both depths, the 60 foot, it was definitely more responsive. You, I could feel a lot yeah. more. Um, 90 feet couldn't feel a whole lot. Um, I think it's got more to do with the current though, as far as the weight goes that you're going to use. Like, I don't think, I don't think like one size fits all as far as weight. So like if the current's ripping, you're going to obviously want more weight to keep it down. So like yeah. limiting yourself to like a one or a one and a half or two, I, you know, I don't think, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, yeah. and like you were saying with the, uh, three ounce jigs or four ounce jigs. Yeah. I don't use so the molds I use don't go past uh, three ounce, but I caught a seven pounder two weeks ago on a three ounce jig. So I don't okay. know that that statement kind of holds water. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I have plenty of anecdotal evidence to say it doesn't. Although a lot yeah. of people that are really good talk fishermen insist it's true, but yet I've literally seen videos of people catching on four, five, four and a half, five ounce jigs. So wow. okay. I, I don't know. Cool. I don't know. It's, I think those are people that want to, yeah, I think yeah. those people, they have their, they have their favorite rod and they want to use it. So if they cut the rig off, they want to use it with the jig. And I get that, you know, if you're going to have a five, six, $700 setup, like some of these people or thousand dollars setup, like some of these people do, they, uh, <laughs> they want to use different, you know, they don't want to use different rods all the time. You know, they have their one yeah. setup and that's what they use. So I, I get it, but I, I have seen videos of people catching them with, you know, the really large jigs. So, yeah, good to know. And then, uh, Ben was asking crabbing and fishing, uh, how many fish did I catch in 50 foot? We had more bites in the shallower water. Um, we caught more fish in shallower, but more quality in the deeper water. But the bites were much more scarce. So you're getting your money's worth. And then heaven and L, your buddy, Kristen, has a question. Hey, what uh, uh, shaped tog jig do you prefer, if there is one? Oh, yeah. I like the, uh, I've heard it referred as the boxing glove shape. I don't, I don't think I have one up here in my office. Yeah, I don't have one up here in my office. But the one where it's a little bit flatter and it, like, it kind of looked like a fist. Um, that's kind of my go-to. Uh, a lot of times I'm using Salvo's jigs and he he uses that, like when I ask him, remember sending jigs, like that's the shape that I like. Um, it just kind of lays flatter for me. And I, I just, I like that versus it sitting up higher with the banana, the banana jig. So yeah, box and glove style. Gotcha. I'm also not a fan of the banana, the banana style. Doesn't seem to work well for me. Plus I think they lay yeah. over too easily on the sides. Mm -hmm. Which Which our, our whole existence is a lie. Why? Because <laughs> those are the ones you use. No. No, not the one. Well, maybe she's talking about a different one. I'm talking about the thinner ones where the jig goes down and they tend oh, to tip. With the long, real long hook. I know what yes. you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, My they, mistake. I, they tend to tip over. And I know get, what you're like, talking about. That's like super mm -hmm. snag, especially in a kayak or if you're on a drift or even with a spot lock where you're going to be moving um, a little bit. Um they just tend to, for me, just get snagged like crazy, like crazy. Yeah. So, all right. So we're up at the hour. Kristen, is there anything, and I think that we got to all the questions. Is there anything that you haven't shared with everyone that you feel they would benefit from as they consider going out and getting on the water for TOG? Ooh, let's see. We've run through rigs versus jigs, you know, party boats, different states. I will say... Um, boat selection, I think, will definitely kind of make a, a difference, right? So 
There's a lot of times it's reading those reports. Um, you know, if you can travel, I'd say, hey, everybody, if you can travel, Rhode Island is like a great place to learn. You just get more opportunities. I think, you know, between the last fall and winter, I probably went on like 10, 12 trips to New Jersey and I probably caught three keepers versus the three trips I had went to Rhode Island and Delaware for last winter and spring. I caught more keepers in those three trips than the 12 in New Jersey. So it's one of those things where practice makes perfect. You have to figure out your gear um, and how it feels on the bite and, and, you know, you'll get it. It's definitely a learning curve, but, you know, just got to get out there, try it, keep going and see, see, you get it. That's, that's all I was saying. You know, just like anything in, in life, really, the more you do it, the more you practice, you'll get better at it. So, you know, don't, don't uh, turn away. I've, I've seen that a couple of times in, in the comments in my videos where like, man, I tried tog fishing 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and I sucked at it and I gave up. And I'm like, hey, like, let's pick it up and try it again. So if you don't have a good trip, don't feel bad. It's tough. But once you get it, it's so rewarding. Yeah. Tog, and tog, man, I don't care who you are, what records you have, <laughs> you're going to have the tough days. Sometimes that yeah. bike just isn't there. And to your point about being willing to travel, Look, it's for the mid Atlantic and the Northeast, you know, it's not like Florida where you can go out a couple days a week. You know, you got to pick your time. We're not going twice a week anymore or even once a week. So I look at it this way. And this is the conversation that my wife and I had. Look, I'm not going as much. So I'm going to spend some money to go further to get on better fish. So when I get out there, I have the better chance at it, uh, which is, you know, Rhode Island is right. It's not that far. You know, it's it's a drive, but it's not really that far, especially I'm with you, Kristen. I'm even driving further than you. Two hours, yeah. two and a half hours to get to the water anyway. Or I can go yeah. three hours, three and a half hours and be in Ocean City, Maryland. It could be four, five, six hours and I, yeah. I could be in Rhode Island. Um, it, it's just it's just worth it. So I look at it from that standpoint. And maybe that's just my way of rationalizing. But if I'm not going fishing as and, often, I'm not burning that gas every <laughs> single week. Um, yeah. I may as well spend it on a really good boat in a really good location so that I can get into a really good bite. And Rhode Island's looking good. New York is still looking really good. I've seen a lot of, yeah. the, I mean, Halkius had his pictures up yesterday. Just they yeah. limited out beautiful fish. Yep. They're getting them all over New Jersey. Now I've seen some down in Maryland, although I think yeah. Maryland hasn't quite kicked up yet. Now, yeah, but I do have a friend that, that he, you know, he caught like an 11 or 12 pounder. Yeah. Was it? Actually, it might have been 13. I don't know. These guys are catching like <laughs> monstrous size fish. It's ridiculous. But yeah, in the early season, they're catching 13s down there. So, you know, in, the, in, in a month, I'm sure it'll be even more insane as the fish kind of start being more active down there as the water cool down. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, people, this is, you know, this is something that John Hutchinson just mentioned. Uh, he was told that all the tog have moved offshore. Well, they haven't because the, the water temperature hasn't dropped yet. You know, yet. once you get into the mid to low 40s, yeah, the, the vast majority are going to be offshore. But offshore, near shore and offshore, you know, they're not necessarily going to be out 10 miles. Uh, they yeah. could be out in 50 feet of water, you know, half a mile off the beach. You know, it just means they're moving deeper, not necessarily that they're moving far. So I, I would definitely don't. Don't give up on the inshore bite. Don't the, the backwater bite is still there. The the near shore is absolutely still there all the way up and down the coast. And it's just going to get better in Delaware and Maryland, which again, they're getting some nice fish. I see them every day in the reports in Salt Strong. I see them online in, in Facebook. I see them all over. They're getting them, but they're still waiting for it to turn on and it, it's coming soon. So, all right. Well, Kristen, thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, really thank you. appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. You know, we're gonna I'm gonna keep asking you to come back and uh <laughs> oh yeah. Listen, just let me know. Just let me know. Anytime. We're definitely good. We're definitely gonna do that. So uh everyone again, Kristen is Philly Girl Fishing on YouTube. Go over, check out the channel. Some great content up there. I'm looking forward to this Rhode Island one coming out. Uh, so that I can take a look at that thing, because quite frankly, your video before that was fire enough. And now this is, <laughs> is going to be even better. Just keep getting better. I don't know, I don't know how much better it can get, but I'm, I'm all for it. So, hey. <laughs> Man, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and for those that are in the live stream and watching a replay, we will be back next Monday night at eight o'clock. And Ed doesn't even know who this guest is. 
this is still tentative. We're still trying to get it nailed down. But Ed, you're going to be very happy that I got a hold of one of these gentlemen that did something really cool that you want to do. Am I going to be YouTube. jealous? No, you're going to be on the thing. You're going to get to talk to these guys who did something really cool out on the water over the course of a week. So I'm hoping to get them on next week. Um, and once we get it locked down, we'll let you guys know who it is. But if you ever wanted to go out and just fish and just do your thing with friends, this is going to be an episode coming up, hopefully again next week for you guys. So it'll be a really cool one for everyone to check out. So with that said, until next week, until next episode, everyone, forget about the weather, forget about the cold, get out there, get on the water and get some tight lines.